Good morning to all of you. Um, for me, this morning is complicated for several reasons. One, with several of you, we've been working throughout the week already. Um, so, and today I'm going to talk about very similar issues as we have been dealing with in our working group throughout the week. So part of the challenge for today was to say something to all of you which is more or less meaningful without repeating too much what I've done in my workshop so those that have been bearing with me throughout the week won't get too bored. Um, I don't know if I'll manage but I'll try my best. Second complicated challenge is that in conflict transformation and peace building work um, psychologists aren't really the most typical profession you meet there. Uh, basically and unfortunately, till the present day, the world of psychologists working in crisis regions is a different world to those of peace builders, political scientists and so on, who also happen to be in the same field. Um, Probably you could say the same thing about a lot of other professions. Um, but I guess uh, I'm always sort of impressed with the fact that so many of us work in very close areas, but somehow still have to tackle uh, with the enormous difficulties of finding a common language because very often we just don't have a common language. We use the same words, we mean completely different things. Um, so part of my task today is also to see if I can engage you, myself, in an interdisciplinary dialogue. Um, I will try to do uh, several things. First of all, I'll start out with a talk on this issue of the relevance of psychosocial dimensions for conflict transformation. I'll try to explain to you a little bit what kind of concepts of conflict I have in my head. Um, and then what psychosocial means and I'll talk for quite some time about trauma today. Um, I will do so in a possibly strange way to some of you because partially I will try to explain to you what trauma is and why I think it's important but at the same time I spend a lot of time criticizing the whole world of trauma to which I officially belong. Um, so you'll have to follow me in a complicated discourse. And then uh, finally I will try to explain why this whole issue is so relevant in when you are working in conflict or in post-conflict settings. This I'll do for about an hour. Then I hope we will engage into a good discussion with each other. And then as the discussion develops, I would like to present you with examples possibly from two countries. It depends a little bit on the time we have. I want to uh, tell you a little bit more about some work I've been doing in Tajikistan and I want to share with you uh, about work colleagues and myself who have been doing the Gaza Strip. So, if there is time, we'll talk about all of these issues. Um, if not, we'll be a little bit more limited. Um, I very much hope that we can engage into a joint discussion and I would like to encourage you throughout this morning to feel very free to comment, to question, not only to ask questions that I can answer, but to put questions to yourself and to me any way you like and to see if we can uh, talk a little bit about that. Uh, let me give you initially some conflict definitions. Norbert Ropers, 
uh, somebody rather well known here in Switzerland. German conflict specialist defines conflicts in the following way. He says conflicts are an unavoidable side effect of living together in all societies and are necessary for social change. They are an expression of tensions and incompatibilities between different mutual dependent parties which regard, with regard to their respective needs, interests and values. Such conflicts lead to general social crisis and destructive escalation mainly in phases of profound socio-economic change and political transformation. That is when the redistribution between different groups of opportunities and possibilities of participation is at stake. A very broad definition of conflict, but one which tells you that conflict is something that has to happen in societies. Now, a little shorter definition comes from Karl Marx, some of you might have heard about. He says, the history of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggles. Um, in Marxist definition, thus, uh, the motor of societal development is conflict, class struggles. And if you take theories which are a little more modern, like Bourdieu, French sociologist, uh, he has broadened the concept. He says uh, social change and development isn't only because of class struggles, it's also because of conflicts about social capital and so on. But actually, the basic attitude is the same, that in societies, necessarily, you have conflicts and that these conflicts are not only a part of daily life, they're like a motor of development. Um, Paul Lederach, who most of you also surely know, says the following. Conflict transformation is to envision and respond to the ebb and flow of social conflict as life-giving opportunities for creating constructive change processes that reduce violence, increase justice, indirect interaction and social structures and respond to real-life problems in human relationships. Lederach thus thinks not only that conflicts happen, that they participate in developing societies, but he thinks they're really good. And now we come to psychology. French psychoanalysts Laplanche and Pontalis in their dictionary of psychoanalysts, psychoanalysis have to say the following on conflict. In psychoanalysis, one talks of conflict if the subject is confronting contradictory inner demands. Conflict can be manifest, for example, between a desire and a moral demand, or between two contradictory feelings, or latent, and appear in a distorted form in the manifest conflict. For once, it's not the bells. Um, or express itself in the appearance of symptoms, behavioral problems, personality disorders, etc. Psychoanalysis considers conflict as being fundamental in human beings in different forms. Conflict between desire and rejection, conflict between the different systems or institutions, conflicts between physical urges, finally, the Oedipal conflicts where contradictory desires are not only confronting each other, but they were, where they resist pro the prohibition. You all know this issue about Oedipus, doesn't matter if you believe in it, but psychoanalytic theory at some point thinks that little boys want to marry their mother and um, then enter into certain difficulties with their father. and. Uh, uh, because there appears a certain level of competition they can't really deal with. And then the, they finally decide that it's better to believe that fathers are the law and uh, that since they can't replace the, the father, they might as well identify with him. Because if you can't, you know, if you can't kill him, you might at least feel like you are him. Um, so that's one of the theories psychoanalysis plays around with. And it doesn't matter very much if you agree with it or not, but at this stage, 
What's important is to see that here psychological theory, which doesn't think at all about societies for right now, also believes that conflict is a key motor and a key issue of human development. In fact, most psychological uh, development theories would sustain that without conflict there is no psychological development. So these very different visions of conflict, what do they imply? And let me insist, they all use the word conflict, they mean very different things with it. All of them somehow see conflict as something normal, positive and necessary. The problem thus is not conflicts, but the way they're carried out. And this is a very, very, very important distinction. Because when we talk about peace building, conflict resolution, all these nice things, we very often start talking in a language in which we pretend that the real issue to overcome is conflicts. But if you look at conflict theory from sociologists to psychoanalysis to political theory, everybody and basically states that conflicts are necessary. Um, so I guess we could say that conflicts are really rarely solved, but that they can change, that they are transformed. And maybe, if all of this is true, we could say that the aim of working on conflict is to establish or to re-establish conflict capacity. So as you see, I'm trying to take the idea very seriously that definitions of conflict suggest to us that conflict is something useful. And if that is true, when conflict goes violent, when conflict becomes destructive, it would be like an aberration of conflict. And thus, our aim would have to be to re-establish conflict capacity or to help conflict again find uh, a healthy cause of development. And our aim would never ever be to abolish conflict. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever in their life read a wonderful children's book called Where the Wild Things Are. Anybody here knows that book? At least two or three of you, four do. Anyway, if you haven't read it, you should read it. Um, it's a wonderful book about conflict. And it's a, and it's a wonderful book that teaches you um, what children can creatively do with conflict if you Jawohl. In German, it's wo die wilden Kerle wohnen. Um, and it tells about a little boy who's fighting with his mother, um, as little boys do, and who imagines that he leaves her, and he does, and he goes to live where the wild things are. And he has lots of fun with the wild things, until after some time he finally decides to go back home. But this is just a very shortened version of the story. Um, the real fun of it is that the story is full of a boy getting very angry at a certain point. It's full of aggression. It's full of monsters. But it's also full of love. And it's also full of reparation. And it's a lot about developing a relationship. So, if you ever feel a need to learn again how good and healthy conflicts can be, I suggest you reread this book. I actually make students read it regularly. Um, now, some issues that I think are very important when you analyze or map conflict, and I'm saying that in a broad sense. I don't care if you're mapping conflict in individuals, or if you're mapping conflicts in a community, if you, or if you're mapping conflicts in a society. 
I think you always have to see that all conflicts function on several levels. International, national, community, individual, individual or domestic levels. There are different levels that happen simultaneously. They are linked, they relate to each other, but all conflicts function on different levels. Secondly, conflicts, conflict isn't only when war happens. We tend to sometimes think that only when we are in war, we are really in a conflict situation. And many of our peace-building theories talk about conflict as if a conflict is only when war is. And war would be when you really have two armies fighting against each other. I don't think war ever happened that way. And uh, modern wars tend to be much more complicated anyway. So I think it's worthwhile to think that conflicts don't only happen when war happens. And also inner individual conflicts, on the other hand, can sometimes be exactly like war. You don't need people shooting at each other to have conflicts which are rather existential. Conflict has at least two participating parties, but usually more. You might want to differentiate between actors and stakeholders that might sometimes be of help. And when you talk of conflict, you always have to think who's involved in the conflict. Um, very often you find descriptions of conflict which sort of avoid to say who's fighting with whom, um, or who would be in conflict with whom. But it's key to any kind of conflict analysis to name who are your participating parties. I furthermore would suggest that we understand that any kind of conflict usually has at least four different dimensions we can look at. Um, one I'd call in descriptive terms political economy, which means I think that any kind of conflict usually has a material basis somewhere, somehow. We're referring to economic issues. Sometimes it's more direct, sometimes it's more complicated. And when I say political economy and not just economy, this is because certain aspects of economy aren't only about poverty and being rich. Certain aspects of economy are, for example, about things like everybody has to have a television. Uh, or they're about certain hegemonic structures which influence there. So that's why I use the broader term. But however you want to put it, most conflicts have a dimension that relates to material social, economic realities. A second dimension of conflict has to do with belongings, with cultural, what I'd call cultural affiliation. And we all belong to many groups. Um, but, and I'm not talking only about ethnicity, I'm talking about many types of cultural belongings which define us in relationship to others, which make us, in my case, I don't know, German, French, psychologist, man, <laughs> whatever, father, many types of belongings we have. And um, conflicts always somehow relate to these uh, ways in which we affiliate or belong to groups. Third aspect, I call it political participation. You could also call it democracy. I'm talking about the kind of power you are able to exert or people are able to exert over their lives or not, the kind of participation they have. And the fourth aspect of every conflict is that always there is a subject or subjective dimension to it. Always. There is no suffering in abstract. There is no war where people don't get killed. Uh, there is no conflict imaginable for us uh, that uh, in societies that doesn't involve also a very, very, very individual aspect. So my suggestion is that when you look at conflicts, you always try to think there are at least these four dimensions. For me, it's a helpful way of asking myself, 
when I look at a conflict situation, what does it mean? And finally, projects you might be dealing with they might try to work around conflict. Historically, in international cooperation, that was always the idea. In development work, projects would say, we're the helpers, we have nothing to do with the conflict. Then, a little later, they said, oh yeah, it's true, we're working in conflict. Now, as all of you know, the basic idea is to say, we consciously are working on the conflict. But you'd be surprised how many projects still exist that don't consider themselves to be working on the conflict. For example, schools uh, think they're doing education. And if they're in a war zone, they still think they're doing education. And they think that education has nothing to do, basically, with the war situation. Or I remember a couple of years back, I was in El Salvador after a big earthquake, which destroyed many of the poor areas uh, in El Salvador and um, many school buildings were destroyed. And big discussion was, well, school buildings destroyed, we, destroyed, we can't make school, we can't, we can't teach because unfortunately the places where we teach have disappeared. Um, but obviously you're not forced to do schools in houses. I mean, you could do schools in a destroyed area also, and you could actually, if school would be worthwhile for something, it could deal with the fact, how do children deal with the destruction they're living in? Um, so this question of how do institutions and projects understand that if they're in conflict, they're always part of the conflict, and they're always acting on the conflict. Um, that's another issue you might think about. And finally, most of you know um, Mary Anderson's do no harm approach, which is a very useful approach, which I find very helpful. But one of the difficult things I feel is that when people talk about connectors and dividers uh, in conflict groups, they usually tend to associate dividers with bad and connectors with good. Now, I don't know if all of you are sort of familiar with this theory, but the basic idea is that in conflict situations, you always have things which bring people together, thus are connectors, and you have things which divide them further, thus are dividers. For example, if you think about Kenya and you have farmers and pastorists, farmers being landowners, working uh, their, their fields, and pastorists being nomads who have uh, animals, then they have a place where they all meet, which are the rivers. Thus, rivers are connectors. But at the same time, they have a huge fight about who gets the water. So the rivers, at the same time, are, connect are dividers. So the issue of connectors and dividers is something very important to discuss once you're in conflict. But, again, I think it's very important to see that not all dividers are bad and that not all connectors are good. Let's take a different example. Let's take, for example, um, racist segregation in the United States a long time ago. Buses were then connectors and dividers because they were connectors because blacks and whites were sitting in the same buses, but they were dividers because the whites were sitting up front and the blacks were sitting in the back. Now, how did civil rights movement solve this problem? Uh, they boycotted the buses for a year or two years. In other words, they intensified a divider to overcome the division and get the right to sit together in the same bus, up front and in the back. So strangely enough, reinforcing a divider for a certain time and putting pressure ended up changing a conflict situation in a very relevant way. Um, I'm giving this example because I want you to think that changing con conflict is something really complicated. 
and connectors and dividers, there isn't good and bad ways. It's much more complicated. Dividers can be very bad, but they could be useful also. Um, for example, also if you're dealing with gender violence, um, maybe you don't want to reinforce connectors with perpetrators. Maybe um, it's better to put certain limits and say, um, let's not reconcile too quickly and let's see if the perpetrator takes the responsibility for, what he, for the crime he committed. So, or at the same time, certain connectors could be horrible. In a little village in Germany, you might all inhabitants be very connected about the fact that hopefully never any foreigners will get to their little village and that they're all willing to kill them if they come. So you might not want to uh, reinforce that connector. So careful, connectors and dividers are very important aspects of analysis of conflict, but both of them can be useful or not. Now let me jump. And I'm sorry I have so much conceptual explanation to do, but um, I, want you, I want to get involved with you on these issues, and so you have to understand how at least I see what I'm talking about. Very quickly, psycho refers to the inner world, to the world of emotions, and social refers to society, to the world of social relationships, obviously. So psychosocial, as a conceptual approach, focuses on individuals in relationship to their social contexts. It tries to combine individual and societal dimensions of, of analysis. Um, this is easier said than done. Um, because most of you heard the word psychosocial when you hear about some helping project, you know, dealing with domestic violence or dealing with trauma victims. So psychosocial is usually a word that is used in a descriptive sense for people working with victims um, or for health activities. But I'm talking about psychosocial as a concept, as an approach. And um, I find myself in this respect always in a very contradictory position. When I'm with my own crowd, with clinicians, with psychologists and so on, I find myself fighting with them about recognizing the societal dimensions of conflict they're dealing with. I try to convince them to forget about their over-exaggerated focus on individuals. And when I'm with social scientists or with politicians or so on, I have the problem the other way around. How do I convince them to stop ignoring individuals? Um, so, psychosocial, to have a psychosocial approach is not to focus on individual. Uh, even when you said it in the morning, I was sort of reluctant to agree with you because I thought, again, it's like when I say psycho, it means I'll focus on individuals. And what I'm really interested in from a psychosocial approach is to say, I'll always focus on individual in context, and I'll never look at context without looking also at indiv individuals. I'm sort of obliged to look at two different dimensions at the same time. The key issues we would be dealing with is threat and fear, the social reality of threat and the psychological reality of fear, the social reality of destruction and the psychological reality of trauma, and the social reality of loss and the psychological reality of grief. I will be talking about these three issues at length and actually I'll talk most of all about trauma. So let me not explain too much right now. And finally I'd say that maybe the key psychosocial word is empowerment and disempowerment. Now again, empowerment is a complicated concept. Uh, it was invented also in civil rights movements. It was invented in black civil rights movement. It was invented especially by women uh, who were talking about 
empowering themselves in a social power struggle. And thus it was thought of initially as a way of not only giving yourself an individual power, but gaining social and political power in an unjust society. Um, in the meantime, empowerment for many people has become um, a word which sort of means when you feel personally better. Uh, you're empowered, you know, you know what you suffer from, you like yourself, you look in the mirror, you're empowered. Um, I think to like yourself is important, you're, you can fight better for your interests, but when I talk about empowerment, I confess I see it basically as a social relationship that changes. But I do think that when you talk about empowerment, you should always also talk about disempowerment. Like you should analyze and understand who and why power was lost and what that means. Very often, especially in post-conflict set settings, you have thousands of projects that are out to empower everybody. They just don't like to look at people and why they're disempowered. Um, or why they maybe don't want to be empowered. Why being empowered is sometimes a very doubtful decision. And why being empowered actually is a contradiction in itself, because the only person that can empower myself am I. You can't empower me. Um, you can join me, but <laughs> you can't empower me. Um, because if you empower me, you've got the power, and I'm being empowered by you, it's, an, it's a contradiction, won't work. Um, so, key issues.